गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स एंड वेलकम बैक टू द थर्सडे इवनिंग पी जी टीचिंग सेशन एज वी हैव बीन सेंग फॉर अ फ्यू वीक्स दिस क्लासेज आर नॉट वेबकास्ट लाइव वी होप टू रिज्यूम इन द नेक्स्ट मंथ टिल देन दिस रेकॉर्डेड वर्जन इज बींग अपलोडेड ऑन द वेबसाइट टूडे वी हैव टू केसेज अगेन द फर्स्ट केस इज बींग प्रेजेंटेड बाय डॉक्टर अमृता फ्रॉम हिंदुजा हॉस्पिटल एंड वील स्टार्ट विद दैट केस Good evening everyone. I am presenting the case of a 3 year old male child, only issue of a non consanguineous marriage, Hindu by religion, resident of El Hailing from Jawahar, brought by mother who is a reliable informant with chief compla complaints of not attaining age appropriate milestones since 6 months of age. but uh, mother gives a history although mother gives a history of 6 months of age on direct questioning child was not well before also so i would like to start from the antenatal and birth history uh, mother does not know her age she has been married for 6 years it was a non consanguineous marriage spontaneous conception uh, she was a primary mother uh, registered pregnancy she had two antenatal visits and two ultrasounds uh, which were told to be normal no history of fever with rash or lymphadenopathy during the pregnancy no history of gestational diabetes mellitus pregnancy induced hypertension thyroid disorders in the mother no history of drug or radiation exposure quickening was felt at the 5th month and she perceived fetal movements well later in the third trimester uh, she took iron and folic acid supplements for 2 months and received two doses of tt injection it was a full term normal vaginal delivery at a nursing home baby cried immediately after birth birth weight was 1.75 kg and child was breastfed within 1 hour of birth there was no history of neonatal jaundice and no history suggestive of any uh, encephalopathy child was discharged on day of life 2 since day of life 10 child had excessive inconsolable crying episodes with no aggravating factors and the crying episodes only stopped when the child was asleep and uh, it persisted the, these episodes persisted till 6 months of age At six months, mother noticed the child was unable to hold his neck, reach for objects, or recognize mother, as opposed to other children of his age. Mother also noticed that he was not gaining weight like other children. For these complaints, child was shown to a local doctor who advised some medications for weight gain. At around 15 months of age, child developed abnormal movements in the form of tightening of all four limbs, lasting few minutes, occurring every two to three days. not associated with uprolling of eyeballs and these movements did not increase with handling the child these movements never occurred during sleep and there was no change in frequency over time however according to mother child used to fall asleep for 2 to 3 hours after these episodes these episodes were uh, told to be seizures when shown to a local practitioner who started the child on some anti seizure medications but as there was no decrease in frequency of episodes mother stopped the medications after 2 to 3 months Around this time mother also noticed stiffness of all four limbs and perceived difficulty in changing diapers and noticed some abnormal posture of lo lower limbs when she held the child up in upright position. His there is history of drooling of saliva, history of passing hard stool once every 2 to 3 days, history of uh, behavioral problems in the form of irritability and excessive crying, no history of repeated respiratory tract infections or ho previous hospitalizations, no history of swallowing difficulty or regurgitation of feeds. no history suggestive of any other cranial nerve involvement developmental history uh, gross motor the child uh, still doesn't have any neck holding the dq is less than 8% fine motor uh, achieved by dextrous reach at 1 year unidextrous reach is 1 and 1/2 years and image of pincer grasp at 2 years dq is 25% social smile he got at 6 months stranger anxiety at 2 years dq is 16% uh child coos and this he has achieved at 1 year dq is 5% child can fix and follow objects and turns head to the direction of sounds and in response to his name the age of the parents is not known it was a non consanguineous marriage there is no history of similar complaints in family members no abortions or stillbirths uh the child is vaccinated according to the national immunization schedule no optional va vaccines were taken 
Child is ex was exclusively breastfed till six months of age. Currently eats from the child pot, a uh, family pot uh, containing all food groups, and takes around 45 to 50 minutes to finish each feed. By 24 hour recall method, uh, for an expected calorie intake of 1250, the observed was 400, and there's a, a deficit of 850 calories. Protein for an expected 22.5 grams, observed is 15 grams with a deficit of 7.5 grams. Socioeconomic uh, history uh, belongs to the lower class as per modified Kuposwami scale. So what are your initial thoughts on this? Not attaining age appropriate milestones in six months of age. So what would be your initial thought process? Developmentally delayed child uh, with no other history suggest to we should think in terms of cerebral palsy. Yeah, that is right. You are you're kind of jumping the gun. What I'm asking is if somebody asks you not attaining age appropriate milestones in six months of age, what is the first thought that should come to your mind? I'm asking for the thinking process. Then we will come to the final diagnosis. Uh, child being full term and the weight at the birth being the 1.7 kg, we need to ask for uh, whether the transition was normal or there was some uh, hypoxia component. Transition as in? Uh, like after birth, whether uh, there was any uh, child cried immediately after birth, but uh, was there any uh, respiratory difficulty uh, was there? Actually, the point that I was trying to make is if the mother gives you history of six months, your first question should be, was the child absolutely all right before six months? You are looking at two different scenarios. If this child was absolutely all right at six months, then you are looking at a developmental arrest or which equates to developmental regression, degenerative disease, whatever, whatever. Of course, she clarified that this is even earlier. But I'm just saying that should be the thought that should be first there. Okay. Now, antenatally, apparently everything seems to be okay. Right? Now, birth history. Any problems do you think in the birth history? There's a, she writes, no history suggestive of encephalopathy. That means, what, why is there no history? So what was normal at that time? There were no seizures, no lethargy, no refusal to feed. The child was taking breastfeeds well. Uh, no abnormal movements. So taking breastfeeds on day one. Yes. And uh, cried immediately cried. as in no resuscitation required, nothing, right? And discharged on day of life too, okay. So, so now with this bit of information, what is the next thing that comes to your mind? So is there a perinatal event to account for whatever we have heard there? No. So then, what next comes to your mind? That either it should be prenatal or antenatal or postnatal or any third possibility? Or any acute event that must have occurred just prior to the onset of symptoms that the mother did not notice. So, for discussion sake, I am asking, suppose this baby had uh, asymptomatic hypoglycemia, premature, maybe there were some issues in feeding. So, in the first few days, this baby had asymptomatic hypoglycemia. 
do you think that can account for what is happening later or now yeah asymptomatic hypoglycemia could account as a remote insult for whatever symptoms are occurring later on any other views Hypoglycemia can cause occipital lobe injury that can result in uh, inability for the child to fix and follow the objects. Sometimes that can also be a cause for a delayed milestone, sir. Okay. So what you should have answered is that the, the ill effect of asymptomatic hypoglycemia is selective and it is not commensurate with so much of delay and all that. Right? So that is less likely to explain everything. What do you make out of this excessive crying on day 10 of life? So in general, suppose a 10 day old baby is brought to you for excessive crying. What will be your thought process and how will you? Proceed. Uh, whether the child was getting uh, adequate uh, feed or not. Excellent. That is the first cause. So how will you decide or how will you determine that? Uh, we will ask the mother whether the child is sleeping at least uh, two, two and a half hour after the feed. Whether the child is passing urine uh, five to six times a day. What else? What else? How do you judge adequacy of breastfeed on day 10 of life? Chalo, come on, this is something which is very important and very basic and we'll need it every day in practice. Besides what they said, what else? Some in infection. Uh, weight gain. Okay, weight gain. So, can babies lose weight normally in the first few days? How much and why? Usually in the first seven days up to 10% weight loss is normal and in the next three days the child again regains the birth weight. Means the weight on birth and the day of life while at uh, birth weight is the similar. It is because of the external water losses and all. So adequacy of breastfeeding first of all is the child what is the frequency of what is the frequency of feeding is the child uh, uh, the position and the latching and all is it okay. Uh, what is the time inter what is the time period for the child is taking the feeds following which is the child sleeping well is the child passing urine and stools well and Baki this excessive crying and all if it is still persistent in spite of all these findings then it would be a pathological cause indicating some CNS involvement like irritability or some infection or some hemorrhage causing irritability and uh, inconsolable crying. I think uh, the first thing I want you to take a note, was the birth all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, apart from the child being uh, low birth weight, everything else was... If you were a pediatrician at that time, attending the birth, would you have said everything is fine? What was not fine? Pick up, uh, pick up that first. Okay. That clearly says that we don't know why, but we know there is some problem. Just read all that and tell me which, which sentence bothers you. Full term 1.75 kg. Why is he low birth weight? Okay, there has to be a reason. So what question would you have asked? to find out what could be the reason for a small birth weight. Because the reason could be with the mother, 
with the local placental circulation or with the baby itself can we dilate can we dilate on that and say we must find out what must be the reason who, who will take this question you get the question what questions would you ask to confirm what could be the possible cause of a low birth weight we can ask for any history suggestive of torch infection in the mother like fever rash lymphadenopathy which could uh, lead to iugr babies and any uh, 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 hi hypertension pregnancy induced hypertension in the mother which can cause placental insufficiency uh. so we can first inquire about the maternal nutrition what is the nutrition and after that some pathological causes like infection in the, the um, intranatal um, intrauterine period and some chromosomal anomalies of the child is having then that could also lead to uh, iugr and a sga baby very good so you would have asked details of mother maternal nutrition maternal hidden problems okay hypertension toxemia whatever infections okay and if you do not get any answer don't forget there could be a hidden cause as well that mother is right to report that there was nothing else but there could be something we would have liked to know mother's weight parity different between two babies okay multiple ways you can find out and confirm that the mother was healthy and that was not the cause of low birth weight but so many questions to ask okay what about placental circulation and that is related to mother again if there is a hypertension toxemia okay or nutrition is faulty the baby will not get enough if all these factors to an extent we can rule out you start wondering whether the problem lies in the baby itself and we won't have an idea what problem it is but we must start thinking whether the problem lies in the baby therefore the baby has not gained weight baby may have been fairly nourished intranatally uh, uh, antenatally but still not gain weight <clears throat> so could it be an inborn error of metabolism after all nutrition is not getting metabolized so do you think it could be an inborn error of metabolism inborn error of metabolism would come after few days of uh, life right so, because that would come with breastfeeding and everything excellent so mother supplies ready made nutrition there is no reason for inborn error of metabolism so that is out then what else could it be some malformation could be genetic disorder could be syndromic we have no idea so we would have told the parents everything looks all right but i am worried about the weight and we must follow very closely and in case you get any symptom please report immediately and what symptoms not feeding well not behaving well etc now lastly before we go to this irritability it's not enough to say baby cried immediately it does not guarantee that the baby had no encephalopathy so what more question would you ask and for an undergraduate is all right baby cried immediately for a postgraduate something beyond an occasional baby may not cry at birth and still normal but that's different what questions would you ask to convince yourself that there is no encephalopathy at birth you have said no en no neonatal encephalopathy there was no history of uh, lethargy seizures child was taking breast feeds well uh, no abnormal movements of the limbs uh, if there was a seizure they would have reported okay we have to find out what they may not report and to answer that question i want you one of you to tell me you have seen a normal baby at birth can you describe the behavior of a normal baby at birth behavior i'm not saying cried immediately behavior and the behavior refers to cried immediately when bonded with the mother stops crying remains awake for next 20 30 minutes and thereafter goes to sleep 
and wakes up after three, four hours and starts periodic waking, sucking, sleeping. If this cycle does not occur, then you have already an encephalopathy. And we must learn to ask details, not cry immediately. Suppose this child cried immediately but did not stop crying for next half an hour. Okay, abnormal. Moment, you have seen the UNICEF breast crawl. Moment the baby gets to the mother, the baby stops crying. If this does not happen, baby has an encephalopathy. Whatever degree of encephalopathy, seizure, etc. is not. Feeding started, all fine. But neonatal behavior, after all, when you said no neonatal encephalopathy, you are telling me neonatal behavior was normal. But you only said cried immediately. So that's the first thing. Anyway, we, we feel there was no encephalopathy. Now at day 10 starts crying. Is it any pain? The commonest cause of crying is pain. Do you think at day 10 is having some pain? Give a thought. Okay. There could be a, a gastrointestinal colic, but uh, that is episodic crying. The child is persistently crying with no uh, known factors, does not pacif get pacified after feed. Uh, so. And therefore, all that you would have said is moving hands and feet well. There cannot be any injury. If there was a birth injury in the brain, it would have manifested early. If somebody had pulled a hand, leg, etc., the child would not be moving and would cry only when you try to move him. So pain is unlikely. Okay. But if pain then, is, um, sorry, if pain is persistent, could be, could it be a sign of CNS irritation? Okay. Because that would be an inconsolable cry. So basically, yeah. So you are looking at big groups. So one group is pain. So pain, as Sir said, is usually an acute condition and it would show in some other way. I mean, it, it has to be like an injury or a musculoskeletal. Colic, it is too early. Actually, you should never label it as colic on day 10. Right? The cause always is something else. Then is the second category of your CNS irritation. Now, if it is... So again, the onset duration progress is very important. So if it is normal till day 8, day 9, and if day 10 excessive crying, then the CNS irritation is something new. So then it has to progress that way, no? So there has to be vomiting, there has to be some other symptom to corroborate CNS irritation. So it's a category that you'll think of, but this is the way to look at it, onset duration progress. So this irritability does not refer to pain, does not refer to acute brain damage, meningitis, whatever, no. It just doesn't come only with crying. And therefore, there must be something beyond that. Okay. Could it be metabolically irritating the brain? Unlikely. For example, a hypernatremia because of severe polyuria. Okay. Could diabetes, insipidus. Okay. But that, there is no such situation. Would there be any hypoxia, irritability? No, there is nothing. So there is no biochemical cause of irritability. There is no inflammatory cause of irritability. There is no pain then what else? And therefore, the next common cause is some sensory inputs are not coming into this baby. Is this baby blind? Is this baby deaf? Some sensory inputs are not coming and therefore the baby feels, where have I come in this world at all? I don't see anyone, I don't hear anything. The babies get confused. And so also, if there is no cognition at all, <coughs> then the babies get confused and the only way to show confusion is crying. And don't forget, early stage of crying could be a sensory deficit. Okay. And I think that's the behavior. So you would have said on day 10, oh, I did say there was something wrong with low birth, low birth weight and now the baby is crying. So I must start looking at that. Now at that time, how would you have stopped crying? That is important. When you see that the subsequent thing, we know that the brain is already damaged. So at that time, 
you would have started looking at carefully whether there was any sensory inputs there and you cannot easily make out at that time you don't want to do VAP and thing like that right away okay so hearing can be tested today that's a part of neonatal testing but therefore you would have started thinking and don't forget one cause of uh, excessive crying very early in infancy is a mental retardation the brain is damaged why it is damaged we don't know and we would have started thinking right at that time okay so the clue starts with low birth weight the next details of birth history and thereafter on date and excessive crying we have already picked up that this child is going to give us some big trouble okay and now we have a delayed development now do you decide what's the probable cause for say static or progressive 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 why he has never attained any damn thing if so, I fail with zero mark, could I fare worse than that? No, there is no minus mark. Hopefully not. Okay, your neat exam has minus marks, I suppose, yes. But, so how do you say it's progressing? The developmental quotient was worsening in all the four domains. Any, any thoughts on that? because even though the child is attaining milestone delayedly, it is still attaining the milestones. So it should be a static encephalopathy, static proce process going on. Any, any person, progression or static, when things are not so bad, it is easy. Okay, and you say, you look at DQ every few months and know whether it's progressive or static. How will you know this? Look at that DQ, minus 8% and all. How much low it can go? Sir, he has still not achieved uh, head control. Like he did not achieve it at uh, three months. He did not achieve it at one year. He has still not achieved it at three years. It is, and the rest of the domains also. The the uh, he is attaining attaining it, but it's very slow. The the DQ is falling in all the domains. So I think whenever the damage is so severe. It's not easy to make out, and it's not important either. Is death progressive or static? Okay, they are saying at the end, very static or progressive, but you could say, I can still hear occasionally faint heart sound, so it is progressive. Okay. So it's not easy. Many of these children develop seizure later, it's not progression. Many of them have a difficulty in feeding, they don't gain weight, it's not progression. So progression is not easy unless there is a regression. And he was holding it, now he cannot. Then I know it's progressive. So basically, as sir said, it's very difficult. So you are right that the DQ is falling. So to that extent, going by our traditional learning, it is. it seems to be progressive. But at the same time, maybe we'll have to think ki our cause uh, falls in which group. So we said perinatal, antenatal, or uh, postnatal. So now we discussed that metabolic disorders are not possible here. So typically, progressive disorders are metabolic disorders as one big group, or then genetic disorders which can have further progression. So they will, uh, here we are thinking of antenatal as a possible reason. So that's why also maybe it is not progressive, but we are not sure on that. So in exam, we'll have to say that DQ is falling. So by that, it means progressive, but because there's so much delay, so profound a delay, it is difficult to make out. And in some domains, one or two milestones were gained, right? So that's where it is. Uh, so, when, so when we say exactly that the um, progression is static, because if you're evaluating the child at 15 months of age and the progression of the child is around at three or four months of age, then uh, we'll be calling it static. Like, like you said, we'll have to call it progressive. So when we call it static, uh, Oh, so the simplest way is to take the DQ in the same domain at different ages and see whether that DQ is roughly the same. 
So to give you a very basic example, if somebody had head holding at six months instead of three months, and then this baby sat at 12 months instead of six months, and walked at two years instead of one year, then it is 50% DQ being maintained all along. This is a very simplistic example. So in this baby, you will say this is static, right? So this is what you see in uh, cerebral palsy as a group, static encephalopathy, that once they start attaining milestones, they do it at more or less the same pace. But there are other confounders in that. So depending on the degree of tone abnormality, there would be contractures and that could delay your motor development. So your subsequent motor achievement may slow down. So the child may head hold then sit, but then standing may be little delayed, walking may be further delayed or not happen because of contractures and you get an impression that this is now worsening. So this is progressive, but that's not progressive, right? Or that birth damage after a period of epileptogenesis, this baby starts getting seizures at one year of age. You say it's a new neurological symptom, so it is progressive. But no, this is remote symptomatic seizure of that birth injury. So that you'll have to dissect out what is pointing to static and what is pointing to progressive. But in general, if your DQ is more or less same in the same domain, it should be called static. Right? So she said that here, if you took the DQ at six months, it was kind of zero. And if you took the DQ at uh, further, it was still zero. So that's why she said that it should have been, it looks like progressive because it's not worse. Zero can't be static. So that's the dilemma, no? So I'll say to Sir's example that if you fail by zero every time, is it static or progressive? So with more and more attempts, you should at least get one or two, no? You can't keep getting zero. So to that extent, it is progressive. You understood the difference? No. So progressive means at three months, so let's see, let's look at what milestones this child has achieved. What has she what has she achieved? Sir, not uh, neck holding not yet achieved. No neck holding no. Uh, By dextrous reach, a child reached it. A child had it one year. Okay. Unit and dextrous at one one and a half years, and uh, immature pincer grasp at two years. Mm, two years, okay. So by dextrous reach at one year. So now what is the normal age of bidextrous reach? Four months. So four months upon 12 months. So your DQ here is about 30%. Okay. Now immature pincer grasp normal age is what? Nine months. And this child achieved at two years. So what is the DQ here? Huh. Nine upon 24. So this is again 30%. So if you go in this uh, domain, you are static, you're not progressive, right? So in the head holding category, she thought that because it was zero, means in spite of three years of age, this baby is still not holding head. So she said that this looks like progressive. You understood? She, she didn't achieve something at later, so that is why progressive. But uh, what we are trying to say is it's difficult to judge in this child and it might well be static with severe damage. So when can we actually, so when can we actually say that the uh, development is progressive or static? Because like uh, it could be deterioration or it could be progressing to something. But what is static when we have zero? So when do we say that it's progressing to something? It's progressing so like I just said, static you have understood, the three months, six months, one year, that is static. Now progressive is, take the example of a metabolic disorder. So this child would be normal at birth, right? Then maybe the social smile is delayed from two months or two, three months or four months. So that time the DQ is 50%, right? So in this baby, 
going by that 50% DQ, when would you expect this baby to sit? By 12 months. By 12 months. By 12 months. Now if this baby sits at six, 18 months, then what is the DQ? 33. So it has gone down from 50 to 33. So the disease is progressing. We are not talking of development progression. We are talking of disease being progressive. Clear? Yeah, most of it you have covered. But when you compare Asar, Asar. DQ, you should be sure that you are comparing the DQ in the same domain. To give this example, now we judged that the baby was smiling at three months and then you compared with head coding. Now that is not acceptable because smiling is here, cortical function, while head holding is gross motor. So at six weeks, three weeks, cortical function may be difficult, but then you should compare the same domain, if smiled at three weeks or maybe at six weeks, then maybe the cognitive was not too bad. And then I would ask when did he start recognizing the stranger or when did he start recognizing other things. So compare it with the same domain because you very well know that if the baby has a physical abnormality without mental being affected more, they will be different in different domains of life. Convincing evidence of degeneration is what is lost, what is gained was lost for not explainable reason. Like he, like he said, if the baby has gained some physical milestone and lost because of secondary abnormality like cerebral palsy with spasticity or contractures, that's a different thing. But anything which was gained and is convincingly lost due to factors which are not explainable, one he explained as contractures. Second can be multiple seizures and therefore multiple prolonged seizures can be a cause of secondary damage. So you must explain in all and one of the important categories to decide is cognitive. So if they are definitely going down and down in cognitive, then many times the physical factors you have ruled out. And if there's a cognitive delay, then certainly the child is likely to be delayed, uh, are likely uh, going down. But at young age, it may be not very important to judge the deterioration. And something which we had seen right in the beginning regarding feeding and baby crying. Feeding and a happy baby is a very important history to ask for. How long does he feed? And after he feeding, after feeding, he gives, goes on for about two, three hours, then he cries again, and then goes on, feeds for 50 minutes, 30 minutes. And so if this cycle develops, it's a happy baby. And therefore, only thing to be remembered is occasionally a hypothyroid baby. Or a baby who has suffered from hypoglycemia may not cry for four, four hours also. Because, not because the babies, but the cerebral function is depressed. In a hypothyroid baby, baby, a mother will say, baby is happy, doesn't feed for eight hours also. But that is not a happy baby. Otherwise, in general, if you see the rhythm of feeding and sleeping, and when he awake for a short time, he's a quiet baby, then you can say that even in the neonatal period, there was nothing much to which we could ab attribute the abnormality to. I think the confusion is by the word progress. Normally you say, oh, you're progressing well. Okay. And here the baby is deteriorating. So progress is only moving in some direction. Normally we say, oh, you're progressing. Okay. Which means you're doing better. That's the confusion. So here, neurologically progressive disease versus patient getting better two things make a difference. So when we say progressive, I think there's a bit of confusion. We are looking at progression of a disease, right? All right. Now, uh, the baby developed seizures at around 15 months of age. We don't know if there are seizures. We don't know, correct. So, uh, she's saying that there's no uprolling of eyes and uh, she said did not increase with handling the child. What does that mean? If it did not increase with handling the child, what does that mean? Dystonia. So this is not dystonia. Okay? Now suppose you are there at that time, 
how will you make out whether this is a seizure or no clinically one is you look at uprolling of eyes which is not there you look at responsiveness of the baby which in this baby there is a lot of issue with cognition or whatever so is there any other way in which you can make out that just now this baby is having a seizure or no clinically autonomic changes like tachycardia autonomic changes like very tachycardia. good excellent so tachycardia or bradycardia or apnea those things will tell you whether this is a seizure or a involuntary movement right okay now uh, if they are seizures are they remote symptomatic seizures where is the insult there was no insult perinatally antenatally it could be some antenatal damage and because of that there is a poor weight gain the birth weight was already low so all these could be contributing to an antenatal insult only rather than a intranatal or postnatal insult what i was trying to drive at is that if it was some malformation etc there should have been earlier seizures so these seizures if they are seizures they occurred a little late or they may not be seizures let's see then uh, if they are not acute symptomatic seizures they are remote symptomatic seizures if this baby has seizures which Sir, is it not could be a epilepsy also huh? could be onset of epilepsy yeah, but that so means if it is not acute then it was remote so if acute seizure means the baby should have had something which is affecting not only the seizures but other functions also yeah so other third category is epilepsy so if there is some genetic cause for the whole thing then the epilepsy could be even genetic in nature uh there is stiffness of all four limbs and difficulty in changing diapers and all what does that suggest hypertonia so now this hypertonia is without any perinatal damage history right there is no perinatal damage history to explain this hypertonia so this also is antenatal whatever is the issue right so can cerebral palsy be without perinatal damage antenatal like any uh, uh, abruption any uh, sudden decrease in the blood flow like an uh, any abruption all these situations can lead to uh, cerebral palsy but not i mean in the beginning in the first trimester and all if it the damage occurs and it is not correct seen. correct so in the third trimester there could be some so intranatal issues which can still cause a palsy and externally perinatal means what you are visible the natal period you may not really see a insult happening in front of you amrita so what happened to crying of this baby day 10 started they are after stop crying it's it persisted till 6 months after that child is still sometimes irritable with uh, inexplicable crying episodes but otherwise he is okay would you say that's an improvement the well, symptom that occurred they are after stopped don't you think it's an improvement so the question is is this child getting into deepening cognitive issues we don't know okay so we keep all that in mind what's your comment on that seizure or no seizure but ends with postictal phase for 2 3 hours what is your comment on that does the normal seizure end up with a postictal phase for 2 3 hours then is it a seizure or that itself rules out seizure so it doesn't matter okay uh, even we may not know many things so it doesn't matter we need to logically justify what you are saying that's it okay you are not doesn't matter the excessive crying initially could be because of the hypertonia 
and then uh, yeah, and then the the post tactile drowsiness after after two for two to three hours could be because of post tactile drowsiness. Mm -hmm. Lethar could be because it could also suggest excessive lethargy of the baby and some cognitive impairment is present. That could be suggestive of seizure so, so what sir is asking is that you we all know that post ictal drowsiness confirms that it was ictal. But sir is asking prolonged drowsiness post ictal. So it's suggestive of encephalopathy, correct. Okay, now why drooling of saliva? Any thoughts? Some pooling of secretions. So pooling of secretions. So could be bulbar palsy, pseudobulbar palsy. So could be bulbar or pseudobulbar palsy. Oromotor uh, muscle bulbar. He has got no following difficulty. What do you think? Can this be a symptom of that? Other associated cranial nerve involvement should also be there. Nine. Yeah. So you got a history that this baby is feeding and taking 45 minutes to complete but feeding. So unlikely to be bulbar, pseudobulbar palsy. No? Otherwise how will the baby feed? Right? I think this prolonged sleep needs to be assessed a little better. Because it could mean improvement, it could be mean deterioration as well. I'll give you an example. I'm sure my colleagues know it. We had a child who had a severe asthmatic episode and he was crying. Okay. And women the nebulization started working, he started feeling better and he was quiet. That quiet is an improvement. Okay. So now, the question is, is this quiet an improvement or a deterioration? How would we know that asthmatic was better? Because his respiratory rate came down, okay. So we had other clues. Here we would not have any other clues on history alone. We could have asked them whether this guy could be easily woken up, okay. They said, no, no, he doesn't even move, even doesn't perceive pain then I know it's really an encephalopathic thing. Okay. But this is just to know how much in details we could go about asking. Many mothers may not even know all this. But that is how the change in crying to now not crying might mean worsening or otherwise. Okay. Suppose somebody was breathless and now he is not breathless. Oh, he may be getting bradycardic. He may be getting depression from higher centers and he may be worsening. On the other hand, he may be improving. So not easy to make. I think that's all in the history. So let's hear your provisional diagnosis and then. So, so if I could, uh, I just thought three comments. One was birth injuries, small baby. So we don't think of birth injuries, but there is a tipster. Like if you have a child who feeds well from one breast and does not feed well from the other breast, rule out a clavicular fracture. But that comes pretty early, not on day 10 of life. Then the infantile colic. We give too much of importance to it, but that always comes on the third week and these are normal babies. Otherwise, apparently normal babies with no organic involvement or biochemical disturbance. And the third one is the startle. I mean, I was just thinking, could it be something called as hyperexplexia, where you have an excessive startle, you are stiff, and these are genetic conditions which can continue for a long time or you may improve in between. So could this be just an hyperexplexia, wherein you have a glycine abnormality and you may have to give a medicine like clonazepam because to begin with, this child has not been normal when genetics come into play. So to summarize, this is a three-year-old boy with uh, 
encephalop uh, static or progressive encephalopathy with global developmental delay with spastic quadruparesis with abnormal limb movements uh, query dystonia query seizures with no significant antenatal or perinatal history born full term but iugr with drooling constipation and behavioral issues with protein allergy malnutrition on history my dds would be uh, any congenital cns malformation maternal torch infection which was occult and missed or a spastic quadruparetic cp but that would be my third differential because there was no uh, and a perinatal history of asphyxia why was there any difficulty in separating dystonia from seizure do they mimic each other most of the seizures are associated with tonic clonic postures do you know a dystonia with seizures which goes on without affecting the sensorium i thought that dystonia may not be very difficult to separate from seizures because in dystonic posture it will last longer but the sensorium is unaffected while most of the other seizures will be tonic clonic spastic etc so it should not be very difficult to distinguish dystonia because in dystonia sensorium maintain sir here the baby is cognitively very poor so the the maintained sensorium or disturbed sensorium is difficult to judge so at that time you can look at the eyes of the baby if the eyes are going to one side so open she eyes, said it does is not going to one side or they are open or closed open but not going to one side but that would go against a seizure yeah. but in dystonia typically movement tends to aggravate the uh, stiffness which also didn't happen so she gave points on both sides because of the cognition it's a little difficult in this baby because earlier also sometimes we have seen that query dystonia and query seizure they don't mimic each other so much should not be very difficult to distinguish one from the other spasticity may be sometimes difficult um so i actually have a point so a lot of uh, so a lot of children come to us with the mothers giving a history of uh, query seizures and they said the child was uh, staring in one direction uh, with no stiffness of movements and um, i mean we cannot process tachycardia at that time but then uh, is there any way of any other way of uh, discerning between dystonia and seizures in that history that the mother gives because no so staring in one direction there's no discussion of dystonia yeah. so you are only trying to discuss whether this is a subtle seizure or no now ideally that in that staring episode that baby is unresponsive to external environmental stimuli ideally mm. i mean that's what makes it a seizure mm. so you need to ask the mother that when the baby was staring at one side if you talk to the baby did the stare get interrupted so if the baby is staring at this ac and mother calls and immediately baby looks at the mother then it's not a seizure mm -hmm. so you need to ask such questions and if they can't answer then you need to see the progress over the next few days so you tell them that you do this specifically when the baby is staring and you see whether the baby responds or you go close to the baby and see whether the baby fixes on your face so that also is a response baby is staring at the fan or the light you go mother goes close to the baby with her face baby changes the fixation so that is not a seizure understood and then such subtle seizures again the progress so these subtle seizures will either increase in frequency or something new will come up to tell you that this is a neurological disease so that's the way to decide uh on examination the child is conscious irritable a febrile a uh, heart rate of 92 per minute a uh, regular normal in volume and character with no radio radial or radio femoral delay respiratory rate of 24 cycles per minute bp was 90 by 60 mm of mercury in the right upper limb in supine position crt was less than 3 seconds and peripheral pulse pulses were well filled peripheral and central pulses anthropometry wise the weight was 7 kg uh, which was uh, minus 3 less than minus 3 standard deviation 
um, height was 85 centimeters again minus le uh, less than minus 3 standard deviation head circumference was 43 centimeters which was again less than minus 3 standard deviation weight for height is also less than the minus 3 standard deviation the mid upper arm circumference was 11.5 centimeters uh, pointing to severe acute malnutrition so the growth charts Can uh, you focus for a minute more the growth chart please Any previous weights? Nothing, sir. Head to toe examination, the head appears small in size, but shape appears to be normal. AF is closed. There are no obvious facial dysmorphisms. Eyes, there were no signs of any vitamin A deficiency. There was no cataract or squint. No discharge in the ears. Dental caries were present, but there is no oral thrush. No neurocutaneous markers, no kyphoscoliosis, bed sores. Uh, there are contractures, sorry, and callosity. There were no callosities. Uh, the child looks uh, wasted. Cortical thumb is there. There are bilateral ankle and knee contractures, uh, and bilateral testes were palpable in the scrotum. CNS wise, higher mental function the child is awake, alert, and irritable, responds to name. Speech, language, and memory could not be assessed. Cranial of examination. Uh, uh, everything, nothing abnormal in the cranial nerves. Uh, no, so vision, baby can fix. Ma vision, ba baby is able to fix and follow the objects. Direct and indirect light reflex were present and fundus was also examined. It was normal. And uh, eighth cranial nerve, baby turns to the head, uh, uh, turns head to the direction of sound. Uh, Why do you say baby was responding to names? Sir, that no, it means you are right. But sometimes I have seen when I call the baby by name, the baby saw. And when I ask the baby to say A, B, C, D, the baby saw again. So I don't know whether the baby responded to sound or really responded to name. So that distinction, because we may take a philosophy of convenience, I said, and the baby, because the baby may not be necessarily responding to name. Uh. Posture, the child was uh, uh, supine with upper limbs adducted, internally rotated at the shoulder and flexed at the elbow. Uh, there was dys dystonia. Uh, bilateral knee and ankle con uh, dynamic contractures were present. Uh, sorry, I mean, lower limb was adducted and internally rotated at the hip. Actually, there was adductor spasm. There was scissoring. Extended at the knee and antas were in, ankles were in plantar flexion. There were bilateral knee and ankle con dynamic contractures. Bulk appears symmetrical on both sides, though it was very much reduced. Tone increased in all four limbs. Power was more than 3 by 5 in all four limbs. Abdominal reflex was present. Conjunctival reflex uh, was present. Abno uh, planters were uh, extensive bilaterally. DTRs were brisk in both upper and lower limbs. There was no clonus. Uh, just 360 degree examination on axillary suspension, there was uh, scissoring. And when pulled to sit, there was uh, the, there was a head lag, and on ventral sub uh, suspension, the baby was not able to lift the head of the, uh, I mean, to the level of the chest or above it. And there is a cortical thumb, and there is dystonia, and just a video to show adductor spasm. <laughs> Touch pain, joint position and vibration could not be assessed. There were no tremors or nystagmus. Finger and uh, nose dystatikokinesia could not be elicited. No meningeal signs. Spine was normal. Other system examination was unremarkable. There was no hepatosplenomegaly. Chest was clear. No cardiac anomalies. So to summarize, this is a three-year-old boy born with IUGR with encephalopathy. Global developmental delay with spastic quadruparesis with dystonia and no seizures uh, and, no, uh, and on examination is severely malnourished with microcephaly with UMN lesion with bilateral cortical involvement without any cranial nerve involvement with dental caries, constipation and behavioral issues. The differential diagnosis would be spastic CNS, mal uh, sorry, congenital CNS malformations, spastic quadruparetic CP, intra torch infections less likely because other system e examination was normal, uh, ophthalmic fundus was normal, and hearing was not impaired. With Sam. What more do you change 
from 2 to 3. On your summary of history, your sequence was different. Yes, sir. On examination, it is different. Can you justify that? Sir, uh, uh, the in intrauterine torch infections, we sh uh, there should be some fundus changes. There could be some uh, uh, hearing abnormalities. There could be some hepatosplenomegaly. None, uh, none, not, nothing of that sort was there. That is why I had put it less likely. And, and sir, she said earlier she put spastic CP third because there was no perinatal identifiable event. So she put it third earlier. That's what she said earlier. Um, sir, even in intrauterine torch infections, would we find splenomegaly as one of the That's findings, what she's saying. Huh? No? So, so since on like examination so. nothing is there, <laughs> she has pushed it down. So I was going yeah. to ask her that, do you want to chuck it off after examination? Not keep it only as a differential. So as far as I know, typical torch has a brain damage with hydrocephalus. Okay. Whereas the rest of them have a microcephaly, but a typical torch could be, because there is an active meningitis there, and therefore they have a hydrocephalus. But I need to check on that. Of course, there must be a wide variation, but I recall that is the major difference. Okay. Second so thing is that... Sir, toxoplasma uh, has hydrocephalus, yeah, yeah, and CMV can have only microcephaly. So there's a little difference. Toxo has hydrocephalus. <laughs> This is what I wanted to say that whatever I recall having seen congenital toxoplasmosis, of course, could have s such a variation that somebody at 8 and 10 years of age comes only with some hearing impairment and nothing okay, else. Okay, All those okay. things are known. But typically, a severe damage is a hydrocephalus because there is a meningitis there. Uh, could, could that no head holding be our wrong interpretation what, what was the what is the problem with the baby hypertonia so would that have led to no head holding actually there would be a head holding even it would have led to early head holding right okay so I thought that after examination, maybe you don't keep torch as a differential because there's nothing to favor it except that pre full term with a low birth weight. That's the only point that seems to be going in favor. Uh, any investigation? So we had done a CBC, a baseline CBC was normal, chest x-ray was normal. EEG was not suggestive of any epileptiform activity. Ophthalmologic, complete ophthalmological evaluation was normal. We had done a BERA, it, it is awaited. There's a X-ray hip uh, uh, which shows a break in the Shenton's line on the right side. Sorry, which shows a? Break, uh, Shenton's line is not intact. On the right side, there's a right hip subluxation. Uh, and MRI brain uh, suggested of a diffuse irregular cortical thickening involving the bilateral frontal, parietal and temporal lobes, suggestive of bilateral polymicrogyria. Uh, bilateral lateral ventricle shows mild dysplastic fullness with mild asymmetrical prominence of the left lateral ventricle. So basically it's a case of bilateral polymicrogyria with SAM. Okay. Thank you. Sir, I think an excellent presentation and even the photographs and in the videos. Okay. Thank you, sir. You have taken sir. an extra effort. Then I want to learn something. Show me the summary slide. I am going to ask you a dumb question. It, the question could be wrong. I am learning. Summary slide. So whenever you have a mother complaining to you that I am not able to abduct and put the diaper on, always think of CDH. Always. If the mother says I am not able to abduct, because abduction is what is affected. So if they are not able, 
So here we were all thinking of a CNS, spasticity, tightness. But if she says in a normal child or a breech that there is difficulty in abducting and putting a diaper, please look for dislocation of the hip. Yeah. But uh, could it have been secondary? As in, was it originally there or could it be secondary to CP? So he has got uh, a ductus spasm, uh, all these things, maybe because of that. The sublation you're so talking about. That's what I'm saying. Secondary. Secondary. Yeah. Secondary. yeah, so it, it can happen both ways. What Sridhar says is absolutely right. But at the same time, one of the complications of CP is hip dislocation or hip subluxation. So it could have happened during the course of the CP. Yeah, absolutely right. But these babies are extremely irritable. So a CP child becomes extremely irritable. Think of dislocation of hip which was not there earlier when it has happened and therefore I think Rajesh had always told us that if the baby has now developed dislocation then this baby would be irritable but baby with CDH has nothing to do with uh, irritability. Also learning point was that what really looked like seizure, no seizure, seizure like no seizure, there was no seizure here. Okay, so not necessarily every time it is easy to record because you are not able to understand the cognition and smaller behaviors of the child during the space of spasticity. Who knows how are the eyes, where is the baby looking at, whether the mother has always paid this attention. So not very easy, especially in dystonia. You know, spasticity like the especially in dystonia, seizures are relatively uncommon as a concomitant. Okay. Ma uh, I had seen only two cases of uh, polymicrogyria exactly like that small head no development whatsoever and now one of the base no more and spasticity because when we say spasticity we almo almost always say that it is perinatal, uh, perinatal. and Rosh Varjesh told us is that a CP with normal head circumference has probably abnormality CNS but here the baby has both a small head circumference and also seizures so this is the second case or third case I saw as polymicrogyria. Yeah. Uh, a child with chronic illness will have chronic malnutrition and super added acute malnutrition. So I, I wonder if I would say whatever plus severe chronic mal acute on chronic malnutrition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we'll start with the second case that is being presented by Dr. Devina. Dr. Devina Dutta, so I'll be presenting the second case of the evening. Uh, I'll be presenting a five-year-old boy. I'll be presenting a five-year-old boy, first by birth order, born of non-consanguinous marriage, hailing from Jharkhand and residing in Dharavi, Muslim by religion and Ansari by community. He was brought by his mother with complaints of loose tools since five days, pain and weakness in bilateral lower limbs since three days, Difficulty in walking and getting up from sitting position since the last two days. So the history of presenting illness is that the child was apparently all right four days ago when he developed complaints of loose tools, three to four episodes in a day, watery inconsistency, small volume, non-foul smelling, not associated with worms or blood in stools. Child did not have any associated complaints of fever or abdominal pain along with the loose tools. For these complaints, symptomatic, medi symptomatic medication was being given. Uh, three days ago, child complained of pain in the form of cramps and weakness in both lower limbs, uh, more in the low left lower limb, following which he slipped and fell in the bathroom and was taken to emergency services where conservative management was advised. Over a period of the next two days, 
the weakness progressed from difficulty in walking to standing and inability to bear weight. Following this, the child also developed difficulty in getting up from sitting position and had to roll over to one side to get up with support. However, he was able to hold his neck when made to sit with support and could move both his low upper limbs, comb his hair and feed himself. Child then developed fever one day ago, which was high grade, non-documented, not associated with fever or with chills or rigors, relieved by medications and active in interfibrile period, following which he was brought to the hospital for further evaluation. Child was admitted and investigations were done. Medications were started and today is day 10 of admission and there is improvement in truncal weakness and decrease in pain. Coming to the negative history, there is no history of difficulty in breathing which rules out respiratory involvement. There is no history of deviation of angle of mouth, inability to close eyes or collection of food in mouth which uh, rules out cranial nerve involvement. There is no history of visual disturbances, drooping of eyelids, double vision, clumsiness or swaying of movements, which would rule out the triad of Miller-Fisher variant. Uh, no history of difficulty in swallowing, nasal regurgitation, weak cough and nasal twang, which would rule out bulbar involvement. No history of loss of consciousness, seizures, behavioral changes and emotional disturbances to rule out cortical involvement. No history of bladder or bowel, bowel disturbances. There is no history of palpitations or sweating to rule out autonomic involvement. Further, there is no history of trauma or vaccination um, to rule out polio uh, or traumatic neuritis. And there is no history at the onset of fever to rule out polio again. There is no history of rash with fever, which would rule out viral, which would, which could rule out viral associated transverse myelitis. There is no history of drug intake, toxin ingestion. There is no history of dog bite to rule out rabies no history of snake bite, there is no history of back pain which could rule out pot spine or discitis, there is no history of precipitating, precipitating factors like exertion to suggest periodic paralysis and to elaborate on that further, there is no recurrent history of any uh, flaccid paralysis, there is no history of abdominal pain or reddish urine to rule out acute intermittent voice failure, but this comes out lower down on the history of negative history. There is no history of papules or, or swelling on the hands to rule out any uh, suggestions of dermatomyositis. And there is no history of cox or cox contact and there is no history of similar complaints in the past. Coming to past history, there is no significant past history. The child has never been admitted before. Antenatal history, it is um, uh, not significant. This registered pregnancy, routine ENC visits were done, iron folic acids were given. 3 to 4 USG scans done, which are told to be normal, and there's no history of, history of rash with fever, hypertension, or gestational diabetes mellitus. Birth history, it's full term, LSCS in view of induction, failure of induction of labor. The child was 3.5 kgs at birth, baby cried immediately after birth, and there's no history of an ICU stay. The child has been immunized till date according to the national immunization schedule. Coming to developmental history, the child has developed all milestones at appropriate ages. He studies in senior KG and has average scholastic performance according to the mother. Dietary history, the child was exclusively breastfed up to the age of six months. He was started on complementary feeds after six months and he consumes uh, five out of seven food groups. His um, calorie deficit is around uh, 650 kilocalories and his proteins is around at a deficit of six, of six grams. Uh, his family history is not significant. He belongs to the lower middle socioeconomic class. He has one more sibling at the age of three years. Summary. So, what are your thoughts from the first complaints? Go to the second slide. What are your thoughts from this onset of the illness? Some acute gastroenteritis to start with. So since it started with some loose motions, could this be some electrolyte disturbance which caused the cramps and the weakness? Uh, 
the frequency and the amount of loose tools are only three to four per day as also the age is five years so less likely your two systems are involved first of all uh, gi system and second uh, cns system it is a progressive weakness and uh, more likely a flaccid progressive weakness from the history we are able to gauge okay so where would you put the anatomy of the weakness upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron lower motor neuron why this weakness is very prominent what is where what suggests weakness last time we saw what we thought of weakness was not really spasticity it was so what suggests weakness he was uh, so weak that he had to s he while trying no, no. to sir made a important point last time so that is again reiterated here so he is asking out of all this what is most pointing to weakness difficulty in getting up you said difficulty in standing okay inability to bear weight as sir said last time that any lmn person will not be able to bear weight you know so that's prominent but can this be like you said a differential could be transverse myelitis no so is that upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron imagine for a minute we don't know but suppose that this child is heading for transverse myelitis so will that be a lower motor neuron or upper motor neuron i mean uh, transverse my transverse myelitis would come with a definite sensory level also and it could be uh, it could present with a symmetrical lower limb involvement yeah at this point i think it's very early to comment on whether correct but my question is is transverse myelitis upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron upper motor neuron no so only at the segment where the level is only at that segment it is lmn below that it is umn so further what i am trying to say is when asked whether this is lmn or umn you would say mostly lmn but a shock stage of umn cannot be ruled out however this is also progressive na slowly whereas usually transverse myelitis is in one stroke usually it's not that it cannot progress the level can ascend but those are uncommon situations so for those reasons you would call it lmn rather than umn right i think uh, did the stools continue or just for two three times and nothing so that's an important thing then what was that just two three stools one day no more stools and then the neurological what kind of no stools was that viral infection just two three times no stools and no more stool and therefore to me that is just an autonomic nervous system irritation stress whatever and whatever lasts for a very short time is just an acute neurological response to whatever is happening and that's not rare okay sometimes it could be uh, with the urination it could be anything but the point is therefore that is not the beginning of a neurological disease but in fact that loose tools indicate some neurological issue stress autonomic nervous system we don't know where it is next question i have is is transverse myelitis presence with pain so which part of the nervous system has pain does does the no, cortical cells are have pain of course you get meningitis no you get pain so which two organs or cells in the body have no pain sensation at all one is 
brain cortical cell and another is the alveoli lung. These are the only two areas where there is no pain sensation at all. But I thought pneumonia comes with pain, no? 30% of pneumonias have pain. That is pleuritic chest. There is a pleuro pneumonia. Okay. Then the why pain? That's another issue. Okay. Whether the pain is significant or pain is discomfort, mentioned as pain, we need to look at that, right? Then if you are talking about transverse myelitis like syndrome, then bladder bowel. Is there any further thing? Hyperesthesia and anesthesia, you will not be able to pick up on history, but bladder bowel could be, right? So what sir said, this pain, if it is severe pain or significant pain, it suggests root involvement because roots pain. So then you come straight away to a LMN, right? And a root involvement. Now, uh, so, I mean, all this negative history is good. I was wondering whether your top upper ka negative history is related to, if you already started thinking that this is lower motor neuron and uh, root involvement, then is all of that relevant? So Miller Fisher, of course. What about cranial nerves? So do you get cranial nerves in a uh, root polyneuritis? Do you get cranial nerve involvement? If you are thinking of GBS, then seventh cranial nerve is... Sorry? If you are thinking of GBS, then uh, seventh cranial nerve involvement, sixth cranial nerve involvement is seen. But it, nerve root, then... Hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, difficulty in breathing, respiratory involvement is fine. Now, any difference in the history between dog bite and snake bite in this child? Snake bite would be a very rapid progression. And dog bite would be a very chronic, um, it would be very remote. This thing and now it so is. dog bite could be very old also. Now obviously snake bite will not be not uh, complained of, no? So to that extent it's a... Uh, could it be an enteroviral problem like a poliomyelitis? Okay, some loose tools. And then you said it's asymmetrical, left side more. So, so polio, polio-like, okay, so enteroviral, okay. But, uh, but polio would be uh, with, a very, with fever at onset and a very uh, patchy, asymmetrical illness. He did complain of left lower side pain, but it did, uh, then he did say that it was, it did uh, progress to the right side as well, like polio would be asymmetrical at the onset and with the febrile illness. There was no fever at onset. See, polio like or polio presents with pain also. Why pain in polio? It's an anterior oncell, no? Where is the question of pain? It's not the nerve root that we talk about. So when the anterior horn cells are irritated, there is a muscle spasm. And that's why pain. And then that stage of irritation lasts for a very short time and then it gets destroyed. Moment it gets destroyed, there is a loss of power. So pre-paralytic phase has a pain due to muscle spasm. And there, here we said that there must not have been a serious weakness because he was able to stand. That is quite against polio. Polio would have presented with weakness, whereas this doesn't seem to have presented with severe weakness, but then progress over time, right? So, uh, so in this history, uh, so, no history of rash with fever. So, you said why you asked it for transverse myelitis, that is right. 
But while saying you said to rule out transverse myelitis, so that doesn't rule out. If there's no history of rash, it doesn't mean there's no transverse myelitis. Okay? And... Papillar uh, uh, swelling and hand swelling, what was it for? Yeah. What is the history of papules or swellings on the hands? That was to rule out, like that's lower down, that's to rule out dermatomyositis if, if but then that's a very low. How did you ask toxin injection? <laughs> Difficult, no? Yeah, I agree. What, what I mean is, yes, but not easy to pick up. Somebody who takes a toxin doesn't know he's taking a toxin, right? Yeah. But I think, good, that he, she's trying to give reasons for negative history and that is, I think, good. Okay, though some of them could be taken away, like Cox contact. Okay, because we are not. But it was a good way of presenting. Cox con so even Cox contact could be ruled out? Like we, I could even remove Cox contact from this? See, acute onset TB spine is rare. Okay. okay. Though theoretically, yes, because a TB spine could be an acute tubercular spinal vasculitis. Okay, after all, that could be, a, but unusual, okay, and to that extent, you are right, just to rule out a possible contact, etc. Um, sir, actually I had one uh, query. Uh, so dermatomyositis, like the papular swelling on the hands, I, I added that uh, very late, but uh, would that, uh, like, would that history be valid, like, should I add that in the so my concept is it is not so acute in presentation. It will be over a few weeks, not like over two or three days. Okay? And pain is a significant, dermatomyositis, pain is a significant feature in children. Okay? Simple myelitis, in children normally don't get that Sir, so called myelitis, dermatomyositis, uncommon. Pain is a significant feature of dermatomyositis. I think as far as TB is concerned, earlier we could occasionally speak what was known as an acute spinal meningitis. Not meningitis stop there, only spinal. And that would present with an acute onset of a paraplegia. I don't see now that, in fact, TBM itself is getting less often, less common. Why is that? Is TB under control? Then TBM is under control. Why our patients have no brain or we are brainy enough not to allow them to do. TBM is getting rare, but TB is not controlled in the country. Why is that? And, and the reason is many, many of us now get infected very early in life. But that should have caused more complication. No? So possibly BCG is the first infection we get, all of us, and thereafter the contacts. And therefore a typical primary complex with large lymph node itself is uncommon today. And then TBM is still seen, but in a high risk situation. And it's like Kwashiorkor. I'm sure some of us have seen Kwashiorkor. And you have not seen a Kwashiorkor. You have seen PM which means that protein intake of the community has increased now. Earlier, we used to see protein deficiency, kwashiorkor. Don't you think so? A good way for the government to ask for votes. Protein deficiency has gone down. So the reason is, earlier there used to be enough calories and much less protein, so protein deficiency was a manifestation. Today we have calories also low and protein also low. So proportionately, proteins are okay because growth is also hampered. Therefore, P, E, M, but P and E go together, right? But a good negative history, most of them. And no, you have given reasons that I like. Okay, before we ask you, why did you ask? So one more out. Acute intermittent porphyria. Do we see that very commonly in pediatric age groups? Acute intermittent porphyria? We don't see it commonly. And in fact, uh, more than neurological, occasionally acute severe abdominal pain they come with. 
uh, so it's not very common. Maybe sometimes there are too many negative histories, the examiner may be tempted to stop at that. So it's very difficult to know where to stop, but maybe too many uncommon diseases can be not necessary. Sir, she's read porphyria, so she wanted you to ask her on porphyria. <laughs> autonomic, autonomic signs. So in porphyria, autonomic signs, yeah. hypertension. Hi. Yeah, so, so all those come into play. It's not just the abdominal pain. And you may think it is a pain causing the rise in blood pressure. Yeah. So actually, uh, because this GBS is a very common case that we see in our awards day to day, uh, in all of this negative history, the first one is to do with the complications of the history C regarding the etiology. What should be cut down on as to make it a very good exam case? Now, for example, pot spine can result in, but pot spine patients will complain of back pain. They will not primarily come with knowledge. If somebody has pot spine, he has been coming off for some duration of pain, and then usually an asymmetrical manifestation of a paralysis. You are presenting complaint, you look at a presenting okay, complaint. Presenting complaint has been a weakness. So unless it has rare transverse myelitis associated with tuberculosis or if anterior artery uh, thrombosis, etc., their presenting complaints, pot spine, spine problem, all these things, they come for pain and later on develop a neurological madness. Your child has complained for here and pain is something will the parent will not forget. Okay? So answering your question of what you should cut down, first I have a counter question. So this DD is for what? Are you are giving this list of etiologies for paraparesis or for quadriparesis? What have you in mind? At this point, because the child has only come with symmetrical lower limb paralysis, I think paraparesis. So now, once you take it as paraparesis, and as we discussed, mostly LMN, paraparesis. So, sorry. So some of your things, like for example, drug and toxin, will not cause a localized paralysis. Okay, it has to be generalized. So that can go out. Similarly, it's, uh, yeah, so acute onset, we said. So this uh, dermatomyositis can go out. Then periodic paralysis is also not localized to lower limbs. Periodic paralysis, my concept is it can be general. It's but sir, if the, like the child has come with very acute history, has come with a history of, uh, which has stretched for the la last one to two days. So it's very early to comment on whether it's going to become generalized or not. So in that case, do we acknowledge periodic paralysis or not? Periodic paralysis is transient or it is not transient? Transient. It could be transient. So here it's already three, four days that you are saying, no, it is constant, it is progressing, right? So to that extent, that seems uh, less common. So these are the ones which you can eliminate, right? So you keep your prototype of GBS, then your transverse myelitis, and as sir said, polio, yeah, back, it is a less likely, very less likely TB spine. But because in India everyone will want to talk of TB, you may bring in that. I, I think it needs to contribute to her diagnosis. Correct. And then she should not get into trouble. Like somebody might ask you, what drug are you thinking of? Yeah. So what drug causes paraparesis? What drug causes paraparesis? But that is going to be too chronic for causing any sort of... But again, but steroid, does it cause paraparesis? What no. does it cause? Myopathy, I guess. Proximal myopathy. So it's different from paraparesis. Too chronic a use for they will be able to walk and everything. There's no weakness. It's just difficulty in getting up. You know, so that's different. So, so it's something like a Vin Christine. Or sir, Somebody any drug... Leukemia and you're giving Vin Christine, yes. You get a GBS-like picture, you start take, looking into the chemotherapy. And that is known to cause constipation with paraparesis. Okay. Vincalcolites. Uh, 
sir, in this uh, sorry, sir, in this uh, history, uh, could any drug which causes myasthenia gravis, we could add that in the negative history as well. Your history is not of waxing and waning, no. So you are not talking of myasthenia. Summary. This is a five-year-old boy, born of non-consanguineous marriage, birth and developmentally normal, immunized till date, belonging to lower middle social economic class, came with acute came with a complaint of acute onset bilateral symmetric pain and ascending weakness involving lower limbs more than upper limbs, with history of loose stools without any bowel or bladder or autonomic involvement, could most likely be a case of acute demyelinating polyneuropathy more specifically GBS, to rule out acute transverse myelitis. Um, coming to the general physical examination, the child is conscious, cooperative and alert. Um, the heart rate is around one, one, 110 uh, beats per minute. RR is 26 per minute. Uh, peripheral pulses are well felt. BP is 98 by 60, which falls uh, just at the 50th centile. Uh, the saturation is at 100% and there is no pallor, icterus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or, and, no and no signs of edema. Head to toe examination, head is of normal shape. Uh, there are no significant features as such on head to toe examination. The limbs are normal and they are externally rotated. On anthropometry, his weight and his height both fall below minus 3 SD. Uh, his BMI is between minus 3 to minus 2 SD and his impression is thin. Uh, his uh, dietary history is suggestive of a deficit of uh, protein and energy malnutrition. CNS examination, the child is conscious, active, lying on bed with lower limbs externally rota rotated, upper limbs by the side of the body, there is no emotional liability, no speech abnormality. The cranial nerves as such not, do not elicit any abnormal uh, examination. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah. There is no CMS examination. The crane, on cranial, uh, on the second cranial of examination, the child could fix and follow objects, and there is uh, no signs of ptosis, and the child can move eyeballs in all directions. There is a sensation present over the face, and the clenching of teeth present. Corneal reflex is present, and jaw jock is present. There is uh, eye closure present, and naso uh, label folds are present as well. Uh, then there is no deviation of angle of mouth. Um, so gag is present with the uvula, which is central in position. The palate moves equally in all directions. Uh, there is no deviation or fasciculation on the protrusion of tongue. Uh, coming to the motor system, the attitude of the child, upper limb is by the side of the body, lower limb is externally rotated. Nutrition, there is uh, no sign suggestive of any discrepancy between the anthropometry of both the limbs, uh, arm, forearm, thigh, and leg. Um, the tone of the body, coming to the tone of the body, the upper limbs, the right and the left upper limbs are normal in tone, but the lower limbs are significantly reduced power. The power of the upper limbs were uh, 5 by 5 on uh, examination. The shoulders, the elbow, the wrist, um, coming to the lower limbs, there was a significant reduction in the power of the lower limbs, coming to 2 by 5 of the flexion and extension of the knee. Hip, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction all came out to be around 2 by 5. And ankle, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion were both 2 by 5. There was trunkal weakness that was present. The child was not able to get up from the sitting position. Neck, neck uh, flexion and extension were, however, however, 5 by 5. Oh. The reflexes, all the reflexes uh, superficial were present. However, coming to the deep tendon reflexes, the biceps, triceps and the supinator, were uh, present, they were 2 plus. However, the knee and the ankle were significantly absent on examination. Sensory system, um, except for hyperalgesia complained by the patient or, uh, when uh, uh, examined for both the lower limbs, there were no uh, abnormal sensations as such. Superficial sensations, touch, temperature, pain, both were present. However, there was hyperalgesia that was present. Posterior column sensations were all present, crude touch and vibration. Cerebellar signs, uh, there was no cerebellar uh, uh, signs uh, that could be elicited. No, no tremors, nystagmus, pendular knee jerk. There were no signs of meningeal irritation. Uh, the single breath count was 20 and the chest, chest expansion was ad adequate. Coming to the rest of the examination, um, the other examination was normal, CVS, uh, both the uh, heart sounds were present. RS, RNG was bilaterally equal, clear, chest expansion was adequate. And per abdomen, there were no significant uh, uh, signs, soft and non-tender.
we have a court or that we don't have no is pe sulange you can come and demonstrate some signs so demonstrate slr go that side acha okay 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 even reflexes won't be possible no? the child is in severe pain so that's why she is saying that he will not allow it's okay theek hai bhaiya le lo okay uh, complete the sorry so okay sorry sorry so so what do the signs tell you examination findings we got power affected in lower limb significantly grade 2 generally we got absent reflexes and decreased tone so where is the anatomy lmn yes but lmn where anterior horn cell nerve root muscle peripheral nerve along with all the signs uh, radiculopathy is also present so pointing more towards uh, nerve root involvement no so i want you to do better no so in nerve root involvement do you have absent reflexes when do you get absent reflexes no no nerve or anterior horn cell right so if absent reflex is the anatomy is anterior horn cell or peripheral nerve so now how do you explain that this is not an anterior horn cell problem anterior horn cell also has fasciculations so yeah in this case fasciculations are not present so pointing more towards a nerve in there would be uh, some sort of sensory level also that would be in more in transverse myelitis i think so fasciculations are not seen always in anterior horn cell Only they are chronic degenerative correct so in SMA it is seen because it is chronic degenerative. In poliomyelitis it is not seen. This is an acute paralysis, right? So means in exam we will be asked why is this not a polio-like illness? So your localization of lesion anatomically. So it comes down to nerve, so either anterior horn cell. So you don't have still a strong reason why not anterior horn cell. What about nerve? Can it be peripheral nerve? since a uh, whole of the both the lower limbs are affected uh, if only one nerve is affected then explainable since um, uh, in bulk it is affected it is not nerve correct so you would say that if it is a localized lesion peripheral nerve is possible if it is symmetrical bilateral and yet not involving everywhere so how uh, uh, shridhar just said that vincristin and all can cause a peripheral generalized peripheral neuropathy but then that would be generalized so this is limited only to the lower limbs but yet bilateral symmetric so you can't explain it on peripheral no so for anti why not anterior horn cell will still have to give some reason but there like you said the slr being positive suggests that the nerve root is inflamed so you bring and then the history you take into account so you say that this is likely to be a, a nerve root rather than a anterior horn cell 
right? And in the history, we already discussed, as Sir said, polio. So we discussed what is the presentation. You said it starts with fever and all that, right? Sir, anything? I think this is purely no motor. That's the first thing. Many nerve illnesses may have a sensory and motor both. The motor neuropathy is also known. So, one is that this is certainly not just the peripheral nerve. The second issue is that this has started improving quickly. Okay. The nerve lesions rarely improve quickly. Second is, it's a smile, it's a progressive disorder. To that extent, it has progressed. The child was not able to, uh, was able to stand and now gradually worsened and now even recovering. So, a quick onset of first few days worsening and now started recovering as well goes largely in favor of an immune-mediated disorder, whatever that is. And therefore, again, a GBS-like typical thing. Now, the last thing is, is GBS purely motor or is also sensory? Then where is sensory here? You are right, GBS could be sensory motor both. But where is sensory in this child? I mean, the involvement of pain as well and hyperalgesia could be uh, suggestive of a sensory involvement. I mean, there is no numbness of anesthesia as such, but then the first complaint was of pain. So that could be suggestive of sensory involvement. There are various variants of GBS. One could be a pure motor variant, one in which motor and sensory both are involved. So this could be a pure motor variant also, in which no sensory involvement has been noted. GBS has a very transient sensory disturbance at the onset of the disease. And that is totally overshadowed by the rest of the neurological thing. And therefore, most of the patients do not even complain of sensory disturbances, but occasional one when you asked whether there was any such sensory feeling, yes, they would come out, especially an older child might come out to say, I started feeling there is some discomfort, okay, as if some ants are moving, and thereafter I started getting this pain and this very transient sensory mild involvement followed by the motor involvement. So that's it. And of course, autonomic nervous system also. Sometimes they might come with a retention of urine and bladder or even a transient hypertension, which you have already mentioned, no bladder, bowel, etc. <coughs> My suggestion is that you may first Sir. put the anatomical. This child has weakness, hypotonia, hyporeflexia, suggest you of a lower motor neuron. The lower motor neuron in this, this particular child is purely motor. There's hardly any sensory involvement. Without bladder bowel disturbances, so you come down to, uh, not I mean, you have ruled out the spinal cord problem. And there is no level in that. There's no obvious demonstrable sensory disturbance in this particular child. Okay, there were only initially sensory symptoms. So you have ruled out cord problems. You have ruled out, you are almost coming to peripheral nerves. And the presence of a root pain and a SSLR positive suggests that this particular child has a root problem, posterior root, because they are the sense of pulse. And then you come, having come to the root, then you say that this is then likely to be GBS, etc. Areflexia is when the reflex arc is disturbed, then it's bound to be areflexy. When if you have to distinguish a purely motor, then often most of the purely motors are asymmetric. If you consider polio as a polio is almost always never completely symmetric. Nowadays we don't see, and even in asymmetry, in one limb involvement there is patchy involvement. The flexors are extended. I mean, involve more than the flexor. The ankle is involved more than the knee. So it's never such a symmetrical paralysis. Though other like polio-like illnesses, ecovirus, etc., might be uh, purely, uh, absolutely symmetrical. When one does not see that. So, purely motor, hypotonia, lower motor neuron type of paralysis co coming relatively short, um, in a short duration with SLR positive, you then come down to a diagnosis of posterior roots 
and then you discuss the causes of posteriors. Even the autonomic system, the cardiac arrhythmias. So heart, heart again, the cardiac arrhythmias. And since we are discussing this, uh, GBS, suddenly it came to my mind when we were discussing torch and the brain, when Sir was talking about it, the O, they have included SARS, Zika. Yeah. Zika is involved with this thing and they all affect the brain. So you have the herpes there, you have the rubella there, causing all sorts of patchy polymicrogyria. You have the Zika there, you have the SARS there, Sir, everything getting into the brain because that is a place which is metabolically very active. So myelination is affected, you may get even porencephalic cyst like a preterm because of these viruses and you could have such a picture. Correct. Fine. So I think final diagnosis is GBS and you said the child is already improving, right? So you've given IVIG. Yeah. We have given IVIG and uh, we have uh, actually uh, done an MRI as well which was suggestive of uh, Root enhancement. Yes, yeah. Result. Okay, fine. Fine. So he's MRI shows root enhancement. I have MRI. Yeah, yeah. And he's a uh, his NCV was supposed to be done today. Okay. So it's going to be done today or Fine. tomorrow. Yeah. Fine. So I think we'll uh, stop here, and uh, before we stop, we'll summarize the two cases. So the first case that we saw today was a three-year-old child who was brought for delayed milestones almost since birth and uh, in that we discussed that there was no event at birth to say that there was any perinatal damage. So we discussed that this is likely to be prenatal, that was on history. There was some debate about some movements which were seizures or not, so we discussed how we can try to separate out seizures from non-seizure like movements. Then we went on to examination, we found a small head, we found generalized spasticity and weakness. So the uh, examination findings were spastic quadriparesis with a small head, with extremely delayed milestones, with no perinatal event and therefore we said it is likely to be prenatal, could be a congenital malformation or something just before the natal which could still fit into some kind of a cerebral palsy, right? So those were our two differentials and then we saw that this child had polymicrogyria, so it was a congenital malformation. The second child was a very classical child with a five-year-old boy who came with a very short history of progressive pain followed by weakness in the lower limbs which was ascending in nature and we discussed how it is mostly LMN paralysis on history and then we discussed what are the negative histories we should include where we said that since we are already talking of a paraparesis of the LMN type only the differentials so something about transverse myelitis or something about a rapid onset paraparesis that is possible we have to use in the negative history and the rest long-standing DDs we will not include. On examination, we confirmed the signs to be LMN. We confirmed a SLR positive and therefore we said that the whole story fits into a GBS-like picture and of course it was proved on investigation and on treatment the child is improving, right? So these were the two cases that we discussed today. We end this class here. We once again thank the authorities at Cyan Hospital for allowing us to conduct these classes here. We thank Aristo Pharma for their educational grant to support the live webcast of these classes. As we have been announcing, the hall where we used to conduct these classes is undergoing a re some repairs. So for a few sessions, we are recording the class and then uploading it on the website. We hope to restart the webcast soon. So do join us next Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Thank you very much.